Good afternoon, colleagues. Those who are here in person at the University Center at Toronto Rehab and those of our colleagues who are online, it's great to be in this hybrid world where we can still connect uh, and collaborate together. Welcome to this edition of the Marc Rochon Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, we're delighted to be able to host uh, this uh, series of excellent uh, conversations that advance our understanding and creativity in the rehabilitation world. Uh, for those of you who don't recall, uh, Marc Rocham was a former CEO of Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. He was a health systems leader, and his legacy lives on through these lectureships that invite outstanding individuals from across the world to come and share their expertise with us. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Alexis Beatty from the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Alexis has braved the trip northward and uh, maybe we'll have some snow for you before you leave, but we're, we're glad that you were able to come and uh, leave the California sunshine. Uh, Dr. Beatty is a cardiologist and health services researcher uh, who studies innovative delivery models uh, for cardiovascular disease care to improve outcomes and also very importantly to reduce disparities. Um, she has received a career award from the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, to develop and test a mobile application to improve participation in cardiac rehab called VA Fit Heart. We have many things that we need to talk about. Uh, and uh, Alexis, there's a group of uh, uh, interested clinicians in the cardiovascular care space, health services researchers, policy uh, uh, folks, and a wonderful group of engineers as well uh, in the organization that would be interested in all things technology and clinical care at the interface. Um, uh, Dr. Beatty's also worked, uh, spent some time at, at, at Apple in California. I'm sure could share many stories if she's allowed to <laughs> about that work, uh, but I know she has ongoing projects that relate to uh, utilizations of Apple technology uh, currently. Um, so in, in her research and clinical care uh, in, in general cardiology. Uh, Dr. Beatty is also director of the UCSF MD uh, MAS program within the UCSF training in clinical research. So clinical care research, epidemiology, uh, and her current research focuses on developing, testing, and implementing innovative delivery models. So Alexis, thank you so much for coming up and joining us. We'll turn the podium over to you. We're going to spend 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll do a Q&A. Welcome. Well, thank you, Dr. O, for that kind introduction. And I'm truly honored to be here um, visiting as part of the Mark Rochon Lecture Series. Um, a lot of the work that I do draws from the work that you all do. Um, and I, I read your papers with eagerness so that I can uh, uh, learn uh, what the best strategies we have are to deliver cardiac rehab to our patients. And I'm really excited to be visiting and I'm looking forward to the idea exchange over the next couple of days. All right, here are my disclosures. Um, and our objectives today will be to describe some of the present challenges in the delivery of cardiac rehabilitation. Um, my perspective is often a United States perspective, but I think a lot of these challenges are present across all of North America and, um, and some even internationally. Um, to appraise the new approaches to delivering cardiac rehab, to discuss the application of technology to cardiac rehab, and to consider some of the newer indications. We'll see if we get to that last one. We may not have that, that much time. So some of our present challenges. So I think, as many of you know, cardiac rehabilitation, which you may see me abbreviate sometimes as CR, is a beneficial program. So I like to think of it not from the medical perspective, but from the patient perspective or the patient's looking at a number of health behaviors that they're seeking to modify or improve. Physical activity, healthy eating, emotional well-being, medication <coughs> adherence, tobacco cessation. Um, and through meta-analyses, we've seen that cardiac rehabilitation can uh, reduce the risk of cardiovascular death in people with coronary heart disease, and um, across other indications like heart failure, coronary disease, um, it reduces hospitalizations, and in pretty much every setting, it improves quality of life. So a beneficial program for people with heart problems. Um, because of this, cardiac rehab is strongly recommended. Um, it's part of our ACC AHA guidelines as a class one indication for most things. 
Um, and it's also included in performance measures so that we can track this as a quality measure. Um, however, despite those facts, um, in the United States, cardiac rehab is poorly attended. So only 28.6% of eligible Medicare beneficiaries attend even one session of cardiac rehab. And the map on the left shows some of the geographic disparities that we have in cardiac rehab participation across the US. So the dark blue spots are the places with the best participation, a little over 40%. And the parts with the lighter blue, um, the very lightest blue, is less than 10%. Um, and so there are many areas within the United States that have less than 10% participation in cardiac rehabilitation. And if you look at the map on the right, we can also look at the number of cardiac rehab centers per 1,000 eligible people. And you see that there are significant differences uh, geographically here as well. So the magenta ones are the places with more than 12 cardiac rehab centers per 1,000 eligible uh, Medicare beneficiaries. But the light blue areas are those with less than two cardiac rehab centers per 1,000 eligible Medicare beneficiaries. And a lot of those are very rural places. So you may notice like out in the west of the United States where there's um, a lot more open space, um, you see a lot of that. But a lot of those um, places are actually urban places too. So for instance, San Francisco where I live, we have two cardiac rehab centers for the whole city of San Francisco. And our center at UCSF has seven machines and, and no other exercise space. And so it's very limited uh, availability and access to cardiac rehab. And so in preparation for this talk, I took a look at some of the Canadian data and I found a table and I turned it into a map. And I found out that this exercise of finding out which, which Canadian province is which is something that um, that's a challenging thing. Um, but you'll see that, that you know, here in Ontario, you're kind of in the middle with that uh, medium green of one to 1.9 cardiac rehab facilities per 100,000 persons. This is not just eligible people, this is just people, period. Um, but there are many places uh, within Canada that also have a lack of cardiac rehab facilities. Um, furthermore, the research clearly shows that cardiac rehab is delivered inequitably. Women are less likely to be referred and attend. People from historically uh, uh, minoritized racial and ethnic groups also are likely, less likely to attend. And people with more socioeconomic disadvantage are less likely to attend. And a lot of the work that, that the group has done here, looking at barriers and facilitators to cardiac rehab, um, has, been, has looked at a lot of these factors. And a lot of these are things that don't necessarily change over time. You know, there will always be patient level barriers, but perhaps some of these health system level barriers are things that we can address uh, to improve the delivery of cardiac rehab. And for the patient level barriers, perhaps these are something that we can think about as we're designing strategies to improve participation. The other fact that we have that's, uh, that's disrupting cardiac rehab at present um, was the occurrence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we took a look at the data um, within US Medicare of what was happening to cardiac rehab, both the number of centers in the orange and the number of sessions of cardiac rehab that were billed to Medicare in the blue dotted line. And you see that big depression there um, is the COVID-19 um, emergency declaration. And so immediately the number of sessions of cardiac rehab just plummeted. And the number of centers that were providing cardiac rehabilitation just plummeted. The distressing thing, though, is that when we look at the recovery, we see that since the pandemic, the number of sessions of cardiac rehabilitation still has not returned to its pre-pandemic levels. And the number of centers that are delivering cardiac rehab um, is lower. So some centers closed and then never reopened. Um, and I think. What's clear, at least to me, is that I do not think that we can solve this problem of cardiac rehabilitation under use with the present state of in-person cardiac rehabilitation. Some of the research projecting, you know, even if every center were operating at or slightly above capacity, we would still only have capacity to serve about 50% of eligible people. Um, and so 
there, we, need, we need other solutions here. So we're gonna look at a few of the best practices and new approaches that will hopefully make you feel less unsettled than I just made you feel over the last few minutes. So some of these best approaches and best practices. So within the United States in the last five years, we've had the Take Heart Initiative. And so this initiative was sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, to try to improve the use of cardiac rehab. And they looked at evidence-based strategies for improving referral and participation in cardiac rehab, a lot of this evidence generated by, um, by people here, that look at things like automatic referral and then referral coordination as the two main strategies for trying to improve that, that gap between referral and participation. And for automatic referral, the other strategy that's strongly recommended is that it be an opt-out referral. So using some of our behavioral economics here to make it the default thing to do the right thing and refer someone to cardiac rehab and make the clinician actually have to take action to unrefer somebody rather than do it, um, do it, uh, do it, you know, uh, by choice. And so uh, the problem with the Take Heart initiative, though, is that part of it was during the pandemic, and so the data are now like very uh, weird. And then they also did not collect great data on um, the outcomes of the program. And so we're not really able to see what the true impact of a program like this is that was deployed at a national level. However, I will anecdotally share that we did implement both of these things at UCSF as part of this um, initiative. So we do now have automatic referral that does an opt out through our electronic health record and we do have referral coordination um, for helping people participate in cardiac rehab. The other major initiative that we have in the US is the Million Hearts Initiative. And so this is sponsored by our Center for Disease Control and Prevention and Medicare. And the goal is to get participation from 20% to 70% um, within unspecified time period at this point. Um, um, but the uh, Million Hearts Initiative has created a collaborative and has this change package, which has a number of um, strategies within it that sites have been employing to um, improve participation in cardiac rehabilitation. And so it, in a way, is like an implementation manual for people to use um, if they're thinking about improving their participation in cardiac rehab. Um, I think the other strategy that people are looking at a lot is what um, I think we used to call home-based cardiac rehabilitation. So doing rehabilitation outside of the cardiac rehab center, um, looking at you know, basically similar components to traditional cardiac rehab. However, you don't have the direct supervision of the exercise in a center. Um, overall, most of the studies of home-based cardiac rehab have shown similar safety and efficacy. However, more evidence is certainly needed in diverse populations and about longer-term outcomes. And by diverse populations, I mean um, both um, diversity in terms of gender and race ethnicity, but also diversity in terms of um, risk, risk level for cardiac rehabilitation. Um, still one of my favorite studies looking at remote digital cardiac rehab is this study from um, one of the Australian groups that was looking at traditional cardiac rehab versus home cardiac rehab with a smartphone app that took 120 patients and randomized them to one versus the other. Um, within this study, they showed that the digital group had better participation, better adherence, and better completion of cardiac rehab, and they were able to have similar improvements in exercise capacity, risk factors, and quality of life. Um, there, there still aren't a whole lot of other larger studies, though, that look at models like this that have compared head-to-head -head home cardiac rehab using digital approaches to traditional cardiac rehab. Um, uh, so we're now in this era, in this kind of pandemic, post-pandemic period, where I think there's some evolving models and terminology that are looking at cardiac rehab and how we deliver cardiac rehab. Um, and even an individual who's going through cardiac rehab may participate in one of these ways of participating in cardiac rehab or may participate in more than one 
of these ways of cardiac rehab, or even all of these ways of participating in cardiac rehab. So our traditional cardiac rehab is the sort of synchronous in-person model, where usually a person is exercising um, along with cardiac rehab staff um, in the same physical location. Um, however, now we also see a lot more synchronous virtual cardiac rehabilitation, where somebody is communicating through two-way audiovisual um, with a cardiac rehab professional while they are exercising, but the two people are not in the same physical location. So their communication is virtual, but they are synchronously having that communication while the person is exercising. Um, you can also have models, though, that are asynchronous where a person you know, does their exercise, is doing their, um, their activities on their own. They're maybe recording it in a mobile app. And then the cardiac rehab professional can view that information remotely through a dashboard. Often with these models, there still is some sort of like weekly telephone communication between um, the person and the cardiac rehab professional. Um, this is the tech version of asynchronous remote. You can also have the low tech version of asynchronous remote where the person exercises on their own, records their exercise and their blood pressure and their paper and pencil log, and then when their cardiac rehab person calls them, they tell them their log over the phone. Um, and that's a model that people had used for many years, including when I was at the VA. That was the model we used within our uh, rural health care. And I think we're evolving more towards this space where we have this continuum of cardiac rehabilitation. So over on the far left, you might have a person who participates entirely in center-based in-person cardiac rehab and gets all of their sessions through that. Or you may have somebody who participates entirely on the far right end where they're only doing home-based virtual remote sessions. But I think there's also this whole space in the middle where people can participate in some sessions that are uh, in person and some sessions that are virtual remote in this whole space in the middle of hybrid cardiac rehab. Within cardiac rehab, we already very much individualize our treatment plans for our patients. Cardiac rehab is already an individually tailored program. Um, so now, can we also tailor the delivery mode for cardiac rehab to the individual? And so I think that's the challenge that, that we're all kind of embarking on now. How do we do that in a way that's you know, evidence-based, that still achieves good outcomes, and still can serve the patients? So to talk a little bit about this, I'm going to go into our experience that we've had at UCSF largely during the pandemic. So um, I came back to UCSF in January of 2020. Um, UCSF, when I came back into UCSF, UCSF had actually just started its cardiac rehab program. So UCSF did not have a cardiac rehab program until October of 2019, um, which is crazy, right? <laughs> um, so UCSF just started their cardiac rehab program in October of 2019. I came in in January 2020 and, you know, was starting to do stuff with the cardiac rehab program. And then March of 2020, the pandemic hit. And we're like, oh no, what do we do? And so I was like, well, you know, you guys are still kind of in startup mode. Like, why don't we just like start up a home-based program? And so that's basically what we did. So we took, you know, this model that we have for in-person cardiac rehab, where we do multidisciplinary cardiac rehab, health education, health behavior counseling. We do intake sessions with everybody. We create ITPs. They get center-based sessions. They do supervised exercise in the session, but then we also tell them that you should be doing unsupervised exercise outside of the session in between your in-person sessions. Um, and then when we were completely shut down in the pandemic, we went entirely over to this virtual model where we had all that same stuff that we have up at the top. Still multidisciplinary, still has health education, still has health behavior counseling, still do the ITP, um, just we don't have as many center sessions and we now do weekly phone or video sessions with people. And for the people who were able to participate on video, we would actually do exercise with them on the video sessions synchronously. Um, and then as our center started opening back up, we started moving towards a little bit more of a hybrid model with a lot of our patients. 
And so I would say once, um, once we kind of got out of the immediate phase of the pandemic, our default model was basically this hybrid model. And so what it looked like would be that a person would get referred from the hospital or clinic, they'd come in, we'd do our intake, we'd do our ITP, and then most people would come in for a couple of in-person exercise sessions a week for about a month. Um, and then after that, we would transition people to, um, to being in the home program doing virtual cardiac rehab. We included both individual telehealth sessions represented in the blue dots here. We would also do other telehealth sessions with a nutritionist or a pharmacist or a psychiatrist um, for people who needed those sessions. And then we would also do group telehealth sessions, which ended up being kind of more wellness sessions for people um, and kind of replicated that kind of group, group environment that a lot of patients really like. And then at the end, patients would come back, get everything measured, get their report showing that they improved their exercise capacity and their certificate of completion and feel that they graduated. Um, and so what do our virtual sessions actually look like? So we have, um, we have kind of a script that we've developed and modified and iterated on as we've gone through. Um, but it basically follows this kind of basic um, outline that we first you know, verify we've got the right person, that they're in a safe place, that they're not having any crazy symptoms. We review how things have gone over the last week. What are their successes? How have they been doing in terms of progressing towards their goals? Um, we go through any appointments that they've had with any of the multidisciplinary providers. We do for our video patients include exercise. Sometimes this is just um, doing, you know, marching in place or other activities that you can do in someone's living room. Um, sometimes it's teaching them new activity. Um, we found we can do a lot with, you know, water bottles, um, cast iron pans, you know, once you get up to high level. You can even do uh, stove top push-ups. Um, so we do a lot of open body weight activities with people, um, you know, if they don't have equipment at home. Um, and then we'll review how they're feeling. And then I think the other piece that, um, that I really like about our program, so our, our nurse supervisor within our program is actually a health coach. She's a certified health coach. And so she very much brings to the program the health coaching mentality of sort of meeting people where they are and helping people to establish their own goals and then work towards those goals. And so that ends up being a pretty big part of our program that the patient is setting goals and then working towards those goals. Um, and like I mentioned before, we don't provide people with any equipment as part of this program. People are using the stuff that they have available to them in their home and community. So for some people, that's sidewalks. In San Francisco, we've got a lot of hills. And so, you know, you can just walk up a hill and that's your high intensity interval training. Um, some people do have bicycles. Some people do have equipment that they are able to access in their home or in a local gym. Um, but we do a lot of stuff just with household objects, resistance bands, weights. Most people do have a blood pressure cuff and scale at home. Um, and then we do view wearables as optional. If people have them, we ask them to share the data with us. But if they don't have wearables, we don't ask them to go out and buy them. Um, what do we use for our education? We actually use Cardiac College. <laughs> Um, it's it's uh, available and it's great and at least for a lot of our patients too we have a lot of patients that um, don't speak English as their first language and so it's really wonderful to have um, materials available in um, multiple languages as well. We've also found that there's a wealth of YouTube videos. A lot of our older um, female patients really like the Jane Fonda videos during the pandemic. Um, and then I really like the HazFit videos, too, because they do multiple levels for people who are both advanced and less advanced. We were talking earlier um, with Susan about how you decide who, who gets in the in-person program, who gets in the hybrid program, who gets in the virtual program. And there's no evidence-based way to like clearly do this yet. Um, so, I'll talk a little bit more about how we're going to try and generate some of that evidence. But this is our sort of like best guess gestalt of like how do you decide who does what program. And so there's some people that, um, that a virtual program like clearly is not going to work for them. So people who 
you know, don't have a good internet connection or don't have the ability to borrow somebody's device to participate in a session, you know, that can be really hard for them to participate in a virtual program. But by the same token, if somebody lives, you know, more than an hour away or has to take three buses to get to the cardiac rehab center, it's going to be really hard for them to come in person. Um, and so there are different trade-offs that you'll have in terms of, um, you know, who can come to in-person, who can maybe come to in-person first and then transition, or who can just go straight to the virtual program. Um, this is not randomized, but we did take a look observationally at our data from people participating in our program um, during the first a little more than a year um, of doing this combination of in-person, hybrid, and virtual programs. Um, we did see that people participating in hybrid and virtual were more likely to complete the program than people who were participating solely in in-person cardiac rehab, um, although there are some COVID-related things within here, too, that make that a little challenging to um, analyze. And then we did look at our um, outcomes. Um, we used six-minute walk distance as our primary measured exercise capacity outcome. And we did see that there were similar improvements in six-minute walk distance between in-person, hybrid, and virtual. Um, and we did all the statistics to see if this is, you know, related to confounders, and it does not appear to be, although relatively sm small numbers. But it appears to be consistent that our hybrid and virtual patients are achieving similar improvements in exercise capacity to the in-person people. Um, a lot of the work that I like to do includes both quantitative and qualitative measures, and so we also interviewed both staff and patients as part of this program. And um, this was a quotation from one of our exercise physiologists who was the person who I think was most skeptical um, about uh, doing uh, virtual um, approaches. And he says, it's not as good as when you're able to get your hands on, get all that material, but it's pretty close to being as good. And this particular exercise physiologist now exclusively does virtual sessions. <laughs> so we've converted. We've converted the thing. Um, we do use a mobile app with our patients. We offer the mobile app to everybody when they um, come in to the program. About two-thirds of the patients will download that mobile app. And then of those who download the mobile app, about 70% will use it regularly. We do have a training protocol that we go through with patients on the mobile app, and it's a task-based training um, so that they actually sort of practice and demonstrate the tasks that they would actually do with the mobile app when, they, um, when they're using it. And there is a provider dashboard that can look at the material. Patients can also send chat messages to the providers through the mobile app. Um, a lot of people really feel like the mobile app helps them with accountability more so than anything else, um, that they can send their data to their cardiac rehab professionals and that they're, you know, being able to watch it. So from all this activity that we've done, we've created um, a toolkit that has a lot of our scripts and templates for how we do things um, at UCSF. And then um, I've also included within this toolkit, if you look at the current version of it, some of the variations that other sites who have been working on adopting cardiac rehab have also made the materials. So you'll be able to see both how we do it at UCSF, but also how other people have then um, played, played on that to develop their own materials. Um, these include scripts for like uh, individual weekly visits, also include our training template, um, a technology tool assessment, um, and other things that we hope are useful for people. And they're all freely available. So now that we've done this, you know, program during the pandemic, um, we decided that a lot of what we need now is sort of good evidence to say, okay, well, who does this new way of doing cardiac rehab in the 21st century? Who does this work for better or worse, you know? Who does better with in-person? Who does better with telehealth cardiac rehab? And so we applied for a grant through the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or CORI, um, to do a multi-center randomized trial of in-person versus telehealth cardiac rehab at four centers in the US. And so we're doing this at UCSF, 
Michigan, Pittsburgh, and Johns Hopkins. Um, and our first aim was to sort of tailor these materials that we had built um, to these diverse sites and their diverse needs. Just like everybody does cardiac rehab a little bit differently at different sites, we know that everybody's gonna do telehealth cardiac rehab a little bit differently at, at different sites. We've tried to keep some elements of the program as core elements. So for instance, for one of our core elements is this weekly individual telehealth visit. Um, but some of the optional or additional elements are things like group visits um, via telehealth um, or um, we are allowing people to have up to 12 sessions of in-person cardiac rehab if they need it for safety or exercise prescription reasons. So there are things that are sort of variable within here, even though we're asking sites to keep to the core. Um, and we'll be looking at this in 516 people. Um, we're also going to include a third aim, which is an implementation aim about to evaluate, you know, what did sites actually do to like implement cardiac rehab at their sites? What do both the staff and the patients think about it and how their experience of the program? So we'll have, again, both that quantitative and qualitative data. And so if we're looking within that continuum of cardiac rehabilitation, you know, we're comparing a fully in-person arm to a arm that's a little bit more virtual or hybrid. Okay, so one of the other things that I like to think about is technology and technology, using technology within cardiac rehab. Um, but first, I just want to take a step back and say, what actually is technology? So if you look at like the Oxford English Dictionary definition of technology, it is the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, especially in industry. So the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. Um, and so you can go from extremely low tech things like walking or talking to a person um, or taking a pulse you know, at the wrist. Um, but then we can get increasingly more technological advances that are applying our scientific knowledge um, for some sort of practical purpose here. And you know, it can be you know, the water bottle to do exercise or a bicycle or you know, an elliptical machine. Um, if you're talking about communication technologies, it's a telephone or a computer or a smartphone or a tablet. Um, but even sort of how we monitor things like heart rate, you know, you can do it through a stethoscope or an ECG or a smartwatch um, or, you know, some sort of combination of all of these things in the future with virtual reality approaches. So there's a lot of technology that can be applied, I think, within this space of rehabilitation. Um, but ultimately, I think we should still be viewing technology as a tool that can help us achieve these better health outcomes rather than, you know, the thing that we need to focus on most. So technology is a tool. One of the other things I like to think about with technology is that you can't just, like, give a person something and then automatically expect them to use it. There are a lot of um, things um, that you can deconstruct people's behavior to think about these behavioral constructs in terms of how do you actually get a person to use a piece of technology. Um, one of my favorite theories is this thing called UTOT, which is the Unified Theory of Acceptance and Use of Technology. And UTOT basically says that there are seven factors that contribute to whether or not a person will use something. So one is performance expectancy. Does it do what you want it or think it should do? Um, one is effort expectancy, which is like how hard or easy it is to use. A lot of times you'll hear people call this as usability. Social influence, what are people who are important to you think about you using the technology? Um, facilitating conditions. So facilitating conditions are things like internet connectivity, um, compatibility with your existing devices. Um, it's also things like training. Um, habit. Um, I like habit and thinking about habit and use of technology because within cardiac rehab, we're also trying to get people to establish healthy habits. So can you establish healthy habits that go along with technology use habits? Um, and then the others 
which may or may not be as relevant in cardiac rehab are hedonic motivation. Is it fun to use the technology? Um, it's nice if you have that, but sometimes the other things can outweigh it. And then price value. Is it worth it? And price value includes both cost, monetary cost, but sometimes it's also time. Um, so all of these factors can contribute to whether or not a person actually like picks up a piece of technology and then use it. And this says nothing about whether using that technology actually helps you to achieve better health outcomes. Um, but there's a lot that can be unpacked just in figuring out how people use the technology. Um, when we do our studies, we often will interview people and ask them about some of these factors. And we'll analyze our interviews in the context of these factors. And one of the things that we've learned um, is, A, the facilitating conditions really matter. Um, so you've got to provide people with training, et cetera. But uh, one of the biggest things that comes through is that people really still matter. So even though people are using this technology, they still very much, that social influence piece is still really important in how people are using the technology, especially in the context of cardiac rehabilitation. Um, people, what they say about using this technology at home, they're like, you have a support team that will go with you. They will go home with you in this program. So people really feel like the people at the cardiac rehab center are still very much tied um, to them, even though they're using this technology. And then for me, the telehealth visits would be someone to be accountable to other than myself. And so again, we hear this, this theme of accountability coming up again and again. So as we're exploring technology in the space of cardiac rehabilitation, um, if you look at the evidence for if you're doing some sort of you know, home-based um, type of program of cardiac rehab, and you're trying to say, okay, if I did home-based low-tech, you know, with like telephone calls and heart manual or something, versus home-based high-tech with video visits and wearables, like where is that study? This slide is blank on purpose, okay? Like these studies have not really been done. And so this is a place where we don't really have evidence. We're using these things because everybody expects that we use them um, these days, but we don't really have the evidence yet to say that, that this actually is associated with better outcomes. Most of the evidence that does exist is observational. So some studies that have used this type of approach and then sort of reported on their experience or reported on what happened. Um, we've done this now where we looked at our use of mobile apps um, during the pandemic. And we tried to say, okay, well, did people who use the mobile app more, did they actually like improve more on their six minute walk or did they have like better blood pressure control? Um, and the answer is it didn't matter. Um, any way we sliced the data or looked at it, we couldn't find anything that looked like it mattered. <laughs> um, so people did equally well whether they used the mobile app or not. Um, and so, um, but anecdotally, people say that they really like using the mobile app. People have a good experience with it. Um, and then also our cardiac rehab staff appreciate that it takes them less time during the visit to exchange data on things like their blood pressure log or their exercise log. And then we're at least not seeing that there's harm. Um, so we looked at the blood pressure specifically, because we had all these blood pressures entered into the mobile app. And so we're like, okay, well, you know, should we just like look at these? So we, we put it into people who started with hypertension, people who started with elevated blood pressures, and we looked at what happened to their blood pressures over time amongst those people using the mobile app. And the people who had high, started out with high blood pressures, they were able to get their blood pressure under control. Um, and then the people who started out with controlled blood pressures, they were able to keep their blood pressures in control. So at least we show that this act of monitoring seems to be associated with, um, with maintenance of blood pressure control. Um, uh, so it's at least not harmful. All right, so next we ask the question of what can modern wearables do? So, you know, I see a lot of people wearing, you know, smartwatches on their wrists. And you know, we carry these things with us, whether it's a smartwatch on our wrist or a phone in our pocket. Um, and a lot of these things can, can measure a lot of um, things now. Activity, heart rate, irregular rhythms, ECGs, um, oxygen saturation. Um, there are now some devices that have been FDA cleared that even claim to measure blood pressure. So I'm a little skeptical of those. Um, and so you can, 
also look at what are the sensors um, that are involved with all of these measurements. And I think that understanding the sensors that are involved in some of these measurements can actually help you to understand some of the limitations of using some of these wearable devices. So things that are measuring activity and steps are generally fairly okay. Like most of these, when you actually look at validation data, and there are validation data out there, um, do show that actually this measurement of you know, activity or steps using the accelerometer in these devices is reasonably accurate. Um, most of the modern wearables, when they're measuring heart rate, they're using the photoplethysmography sensor. So it's basically light that's going in and measuring you know, changes in the pulse. But when you look at the PPG, what you see is a tracing like this, when it's a cleaned up PPG tracing, where it, um, where it goes in sort of here, up and down. Um, and so you can use those PPG tracings then and apply algorithms to it to say, okay, well, is this a regular heart ry rhythm or is this an irregular heart rhythm? And that's what all of the irregular rhythm based things both for Fitbit and Apple Watch are based on. You know, they're based on this PPG just saying, is this regular or is this irregular? It has nothing whatsoever to do with the ECG. Um, and so as you can imagine, there can be false positives there. So if you have a person who has frequent PVCs or frequent PACs, those are some of the more common reasons why you can get false positives on an irregular rhythm notification. You can also now do ECGs. So you can do ECGs either spot at the wrist, which is kind of like the lead one, um, although there are now some companies too that will um, market patches that you can put on that can also measure an ECG nearly continuously. I think the validation data are pretty weak for both O2SAT and for blood pressure. Most of the blood pressure algorithms are based on um, the PPG um, some of them also include PPG and ECG signals, um, and then algorithms, and then you have to calibrate it. And then the calibration drifts over time, so you have to recalibrate it. I'm not sure that it really offers that much more over cuff blood pressure. <laughs> um, so how do I use wearables um, in my practice? So if I have a patient who doesn't have one um, um, or want to use one, I teach them how to do the low tech stuff. You know, rate their rating of perceived exertion, take their pulse. They don't have to get one or buy one if they don't already have one. Um, but for people who do already have one and want to use it, um, I basically educate them on what the features are and how they can use them. And then I also teach the patients how they can send me their data when they have questions. And so if you have an Apple based device, people can send you their data from this share sheet that's in the upper right hand corner um, of most interfaces. The other technology that we're seeing within cardiac rehab now is the offering of virtual cardiac rehab as a service. And so these are third party companies that now can provide cardiac rehab not at a center, not as part of a center or hospital based program. Um, and so there's uh, companies that will assess pre and post metrics virtually. Um, they have cardiac rehab staff that have, um, uh, that are supervised by an MD medical director. They do two-way audiovisual communication with people. Most of them will send people a tech package that goes along with this, including some wearables and sometimes even some exercise equipment. Um, and so, so you can imagine that you can now refer people to external cardiac rehab, so someone who you know, we have a four month waiting list, for instance, at our UCSF program. And so if someone doesn't want to wait for four months and we can't take care of them and they don't live close to another cardiac rehab center that can take care of them, you know, maybe this third party service is, is an option that could be available to them. We still don't have data though on whether these services actually achieve similar outcomes. Um, so this whole technology section hopefully has, has um, open people up to the fact that there are so many opportunities for scholarship in this area of delivery of cardiac rehab. And so I think for the you know, trainees who are here and listening in, um, I think there's, there's a lot that you, can, um, that you can study in this area to learn more. Okay, I'm just gonna take a few minutes 
on emerging indications at the end here. I'm gonna not talk very much about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, except to say that there's an ongoing rehab HF study in the US that will provide more data on rehab for HEFPAC. Um, I think there's a lot going on in atrial fibrillation, and some of the research has definitely shown um, that doing cardiac rehab-like models for atrial fibrillation can reduce atrial fibrillation um, recurrence, but there's been no sort of big, large-scale studies on that. So I think that's another area that someone could do a study on if they haven't already started. And then the last area, which I know has overlap with um, some of the work that's done here, is cancer. And I think that um, there's a lot of things that make sense about doing um, rehab for cancer patients. You know, there's um, this multiple hit issue with cancer therapies in the modern era. So A, there's a lot of shared risk factors between cancer and cardiovascular disease. Um, there's also a lot of injury that we're seeing from cancer therapies um, to the heart, whether it's from, you know, traditional chemotherapeutic agents like adromycin, or it's from newer chemotherapeutic agents like some of these checkpoint inhibitors, um, radiation to the chest, um, and hormone-based therapies. And then there's also a lot of this like indirect injury, the fact that people's lives just change when they get cancer. Um, a lot of people experience weight gain, sedentary activity around the time of cancer diagnosis. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense, not just to have exercise as a treatment for this, but also to have a multidisciplinary program like we provide in cardiac rehab that addresses psychosocial issues, nutrition, and other things as well. And so I think similar to some of the work that's done here, we've started exploring, um, um, addressing, um, trying to adapt to the cardiac rehab model to breast cancer survivors. So we're doing this project at our county hospital, which is San Francisco General Hospital, so serves a large um, proportion of people who are, um, who are you know, marginalized in society at or below the poverty level. Um, and, um, and so we've established a patient and community advisory board, and so it's very much a patient and community engaged research project. And last year we engaged in formative research with 30 people. Um, we did these sessions that we call human-centered design sessions where we kind of walk through with people what the experience might be like for them. Um, and we've done these in English, Spanish, and Cantonese, which are our top three languages. And then we just started enrolling people in our pilot study in the last couple of weeks um, where we're going to pilot a 12-week intervention in 50 people. And so if you look at sort of the map of what this intervention is going to end up looking like, People will get referred to the program. We will do an intake and individualized treatment plan just like we would do in cardiac rehabilitation. And then we've set these up so that they're um, 12 weeks of weekly sessions, um, but uh, very much so in this breast cancer population, they felt that this in-person group was important. Um, and, and they really felt that bond with people. And so we've tried to keep, to alternate sessions between individual focused sessions and group focused sessions. Our individual focused sessions may include either in person or virtually depending on the patient's needs. So if patients aren't able to come in person, we'll do them virtually. If patients can't do virtual, we'll do them in person. And then we will be asking people to exercise on their own or in the community um, as part of this experience. And the program components end up being very, very similar to um, a cardiac rehabilitation program. That they include physical activity, nutrition, emotional well-being. Um, we found very few women recognized that they were at almost two times the risk of cardiovascular disease compared to people who had not had breast cancer. So there's a lot of um, people like not knowing about these things. Um, we, we have about over half actually have high blood pressure, um, and a lot are not on medications. Um, our six-minute walk distance in these patients is like as bad as our cardiac patients. Um, and so it's, it's a really, uh, I think, very high-risk patients. And, and these, these aren't even people who have cardiotoxicity. This is just people who have survived breast cancer. Um, and then we'll also have survivorship components within this. Um, and so this will be you know, ongoing work that we expect to be doing over the next few years. So in summary, Cardiac rehab is underused and delivered inequitably. 
but best practices and new approaches do offer hope for improving equitable access to cardiac rehab. And stay tuned for some of our emerging indications for cardiac rehab. And I hope that we can go from this present where we do a pretty bad job of getting people into cardiac rehab to a future where when we use evidence-based strategies and we have more options for people that we can actually get to the point where we get most people coming to cardiac rehab. Thank you. All right, folks, well, thank you so much, Alexis, for a wonderful session. Uh, so many fabulous ideas, inspiring uh, ideas percolating. We're moving into a Q&A session, and our colleagues online, stay tuned for second cameras. They're just moving so you can follow us at the table. The idea for the next several minutes will be to entertain some questions from folks in the room. Uh, and uh, Dr. Susan Marzellini is monitoring questions online. This is a full service type of session for you. So I wonder if anyone wants to start this up. And Tim, once he has camera up and running, we'll be circulating with the microphone. We have our first question in the back left part from Dr. Shiroz Tom, one of our scientists in technology. Take the mic so Hello. folks can hear you online. OK. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, we have a session, I think, booked later on in the afternoon, so I'm going to talk a little bit more. But I just wanted to know about, so you talk about this, uh, this app uh, in the virtual rehab or the hybrid program. Can you tell us a little bit about the capabilities of that app? Like, what does it contain, and how did people use it? Yeah, so we use one of the commercially available apps. The one that we use is from Channel Health. Um, and it has, uh, it has, it allows the patient to do logging, so they can log their blood pressure, they can log their exercise. Um, it allows patients to view education materials, and the education materials that are loaded as part of ours are the Thrive curriculum. Um, and so it goes through that curriculum over the course of 12 weeks with the participant for their educational materials. Um, it lets people do uh, medication reminders. And so that's one of the features that patients also like to use is putting in the medication reminder so it can schedule times to get a notification to remind them to take their medications. And then it includes a chat. So they can send messages to the cardiac rehab team um, with questions. We do instruct patients that they should not be using it for emergencies, that, it, that that's when they call for, for any emergency services, but that if they have a question like, you know, hey, you know, I'm trying to change this thing about my diet. Do you have any, like, good resources on Mediterranean diet, for instance? And then the cardiac rehab professional can then, they have a dashboard that they can look at for all the patients, and they can go into that, that particular message and attach a resource and send it back to the, to the patient. Uh, that this much comprehensive, but we are also developing something like an avatar-based uh, virtual rehab, uh, cardiac rehab kind of uh, situation, and we'll, we'll talk more later about it. We can show you like a little demo as well. So the idea is to monitor a person's exercises, you know, while they're doing it, while an avatar is kind of guiding them to do these exercises. So it will be nice to talk more. Thank yeah. you. Uh, super. Well, th well, thanks for that uh, question response. Um, question in the back. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for the presentation. It was great. Um, I have two questions. My first question for the virtual cardiac rehab would be, um, are there any additional measures that you would take in terms of safety? So, like, how can you prevent emergencies or how would you deal with that um, in terms of virtual cardiac rehab? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the safety aspect is one of the things that I think a lot of people are concerned about with virtual cardiac rehab. Um, so first, I just want to reiterate that it, it still is like a medically supervised program. So like all these people are evaluated. They get an intake assessment, you know, with, in our case, with a nurse. And then we do have um, MD medical supervision over the whole program. So those pieces are the same for what we usually have for in-person cardiac rehab. And then anybody that we do have concerns about them having, for instance, arrhythmias or hypotension with exercise, 
those would be people that we would usually not send directly to virtual cardiac rehab. We would have them come in and do at least a few sessions in person on the monitor before we would send them to do home cardiac rehab. And then our people who do come in and are doing all virtual home cardiac rehab, we have a, um, a process that we go through as part of our script at the beginning where you say, okay, you know, where are you? <laughs> so you can get their address if you happen to see while you're exercising with them that they have an emergency, you can call emergency services. Um, we've had no safety events, you know, during that synchronized exercise session, so we haven't had that happen yet, but we still do that process at the beginning. And then each patient also has their own, like, safety card for, like, who am I supposed to call if I have a safety event? And so they have, like, all their numbers written down and all the procedures that they're supposed to take if they were to have an event, like, not during that exercise session. Thank you. Um, and my second question would be, um, would there be, would you say that there's a faster exercise progression in the in-person as, like, compared to the virtual? Um, so, so far we've not seen big differences. Um, I will say that the better measured data on this doesn't come from us. The better measured data on this comes from um, Stephen Katayan and his group at um, Henry Ford, because they've actually measured a lot of um, data on exercise progression and exercise capacity in a much more granular way. And they've shown that people participating in their hybrid program are able to sort of progress similarly through um, exercise programs. We just have anecdotal data and our our exercise physiologist, who's now our virtual person, he, you know, he's a taskmaster. He gets those people uh, doing lots of good stuff. And I think part of it, too, is that we don't just do aerobic exercise. We also do strength training. And so I think that that really helps people, too, to just improve throughout the course of time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Going to uh, Susan, and then we'll go to Jerry. Yeah. Uh, quick question. In our chat before you, you uh, started your talk, and thank you so much for this great talk. It was amazing. Um, you mentioned that virtual models of care are no longer supported or reimbursed in the U.S. How do you think that might affect the future of uh, virtual care? So within the U.S., um, so they were reimbursed during the pandemic. Um, all telehealth stuff was reimbursed during the pandemic. But then starting in May of this year, they took away reimbursement for hospital outpatient programs, um, which is how 97% of cardiac rehab is delivered in the US. And so we don't get paid for um, telehealth delivered cardiac rehab through Medicare anymore. There are a few private payers in the US that are paying for telehealth cardiac rehab. And so that's the main method of reimbursement right now. So some states, for instance, Michigan, and South Carolina um, have um, their private payers reimburse cardiac rehab, but a lot of places they, they don't. And we have, like, it's spotty in California which payers will reimburse it. But it, I mean, it's not going to happen until it's reimbursed. So. Thank you. Yeah. So hopefully this ongoing There's, evidence build will change that. Well, right? I, think, yeah. I think it's evidence build, but then there, there are also bills before Congress right now. Um, but, you know, U U.S. Congress, I think you probably hear about how dysfunctional they are. So I'm not, uh, I'm not going to hold my breath. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. I, I know we're almost out of time, and I think you had a question too. Uh, so I'm just so thrilled to have you here, and, and I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I guess just a comment and then a question. So, um, you know, just this whole home versus hospital, and I, I was really excited to see Steve Catane's data about you know, exercise intensity to it in the home base, and it is quite equivalent. Um, but I, I was talking with Rod Taylor recently, who does the Cochrane reviews and home and hospital, they just updated it, and they looked at um, utilization as an outcome this time. And, you know, it's really apples and oranges, though, when I see you putting up data about, you know, adherence, uh, completion, but, you know, I just keep thinking, you know, it's not the same thing. You go on a call and you talk with someone, versus driving yourself, getting there for an hour. And, you know, in some studies, they're calling that both, you know, at, at attendance at one session. Um, I think it is a bit better now because you're doing synchronous online, so they have to exercise still. 
but I guess I just wondered, you know, what thoughts you had about that, and and um, yeah, I'll, I'll just yeah. yeah. What what is dose? You know, like what is what is the dose of health? You know, is it is it you know, what is twelve weekly sessions the same as you know thirty six uh, sessions over twelve weeks? Like I don't. You don't but you're doing. I see. I see you're measuring. You know. Um, functional capacity at the end. Yeah. And I do think, you know, maybe we just move to that, right? Because that's really what's important. But I, I think it is an important question too, is that can we engage patients to longer term? And you showed that data at the beginning. Yep. So longer term. So anyways, that's just a, and then I, just one other question is, um, you know, the, the idea of psychosocial well-being, right? So you talked about your factors too, and I do think, um, you know, 20% of these patients are depressed. Um, you know, how do you think in terms, like, I'd love to see a consensus statement on, you know, how do we triage patients? You know, you've got a lot of important factors, but I wonder what you think about, you know, people who have maybe mild or moderate depression. Should they, what, you know, what do you think we should do with them? Yeah, I think, again, this is, an, I think it's individualized. Because there's some patients that, um, that, like, even getting out of their house is, like, hard. And so maybe engaging them, maybe it's flipped from like our hybrid model. Maybe they actually start out with like individual sessions at home and then as they're improving or getting better or getting treated, they then come to the, set, the center. But it probably is a, it probably is individualized. We tend to, in our patient, if they do screen positive for depression, we prioritize those people for seeing our, we do have a psychiatrist who works directly with our program. We prioritize them for seeing the psychiatrist early in the process um, so that they can um, try to get um, some of those issues addressed. But it's, it's, it's a little tough sometimes. Yeah. So, and, then, and then some of the patients, do they even get into cardiac rehab in the first place? Yeah. yeah. Great. Any other questions in the room? We're just over the hour. Anything else online, Susan? Um, if not, just it being uh, respectful of the number of meetings you still have, Dr. B, okay. <laughs> this afternoon and tomorrow, why don't we draw this session to a close? It's been a wonderful overview of the current state of cardiac rehab and where we need to go. Of course, those of us who work in cardiac rehab uh, have, have a strong affinity for all the things that you are doing. We've enjoyed the collaborations that have started. They'll only get stronger, uh, I think, going forward, which is, which is marvelous to see. And uh, your leadership in this area is, is so admirable. So thank you very much for taking the time, coming to Toronto, delivering this lecture in such a spectacular way. On behalf of those online and those on the, in the room, let's, let's give you a round of applause and thanks so much. Thank you, thank you. For folks online, thanks for joining. We'll sign off at this point, but uh, look forward to uh, the next in the series of the Marc Fauchon lectures, which are spectacular, as well as all the other amazing activities within the patient world. Thank you all. Thank you.